Sprinkles, The True Spirit of Christmas by P.K. McLemore Narrated by Judy Morris Chapter 1 In the North Pole, vanilla ice cream scoops of snow dotted the ground, while tiny marshmallow flakes fell steadily from the sky. It was a deliciously magical place, where dreams and toys were gifts for the asking. On this particular night, just two days before Christmas, a fierce wind was blowing, sending the snow flying in all directions. All of Santa's helpers were tucked away indoors, awaiting the birth of the newest reindeer. They sat by a fire in a well-lit cave, enjoying the warmth and talking about the baby being born in the next room. Santa and Mrs. Claus were there, as were a small group of elves and several of the woodland animals. Suddenly, they heard a cry, and they all jumped up to greet Mrs. Prancer's new baby. Entering the tiny bedroom, they saw Mrs. Prancer cuddling her newborn reindeer to her chest, while Prancer looked on lovingly. A proud father, Prancer turned away so they wouldn't see his tears. But Mrs. Claus reached out and turned him back around. Happy tears are always welcome, my dear, she whispered. She kissed his cheek and said, Now let's see the little one. Mrs. Prancer loosened her arms a bit, and Santa rushed up first. It's a girl, he exclaimed grandly. A beautiful little girl. Sprinkles was tiny, barely bigger than an elf. Her creamy chocolate skin was sprinkled with milky white polka dots. Mrs. Prancer smiled. We'll call her Sprinkles. Just as Mrs. Prancer spoke, a light gust of snow swirled through the bedroom, showering Sprinkles' face. She opened her eyes, blinked, and slowly looked at the smiling crowd surrounding her. Her smile was radiant, gleaming brighter than the whitest snow. Everyone who looked at her felt their hearts fill with joy and love. But Sprinkles' smile faded suddenly. She closed her eyes and became very still. Everyone gasped. What's wrong? cried Prancer. She's not moving. Mrs. Prancer gently nuzzled her baby, trying to soothe her awake, but nothing happened. Sprinkles was lying there still as death. Then Santa decided to try. He took Sprinkles in his arms and let his beard tickle her nose. Finally, he looked up, shaking his head sadly, and said, She's a tiny one, she is, the first reindeer to be born this early. Santa looked away from Mrs. Prancer, who was crying, and instead focused on his loyal friend Prancer. I'm sorry, Prancer. Prancer continued to stare at his baby, letting his wet reindeer tears fall slowly to the floor. By now, everyone was crying, and the warm, salty tears were melting the snow-hardened floor of the bedroom. Just then, the flames from the fire began to rise, and, as everyone watched in amazement, one of the embers flew out of the fire and danced slowly around the baby reindeer's small, still body. But this was no ordinary ember. It's China, the princess of dreams, born of Sprinkles' need and infused with her sleepy powers. China put her ear to Sprinkles' chest and heard the soft but steady beat. With a flourish, she reached into a little pouch and sprinkled golden flakes into Sprinkles' lifeless eyes. From this day on, whispered China softly, you will be the heart and soul of all mankind, the very spirit of Christmas. Now wake and spread your love and joy throughout the world. When China finished, she flew back into the fire, and as the flame settled down, Sprinkles opened her eyes and cried. The cry was a tiny one, but it sounded like a symphony to Sprinkle's parents and friends. Tears were replaced with smiles, and everyone clapped and danced. Their hearts once again were filled with love and joy. Santa twirled around and proclaimed, Blessed be, such a tiny thing. Look at those eyes so blue. They will fill the hearts and souls of all mankind with love and joy. Then he turned to Sprinkle's and proclaimed, Sprinkles, you indeed are the spirit of Christmas. The fire in the little cave burned brightly all night as Sprinkles' friends rejoiced in the little reindeer and her miraculous recovery. 
they were sure that everyone in the world would be happier now that Sprinkles was born. Chapter 2 But life was not that happy elsewhere in the world. There were lots of people who didn't understand the meaning of Christmas, who were unhappy and had lost their way. Two such people were, at that very moment, sitting in a garbage-filled alley. Their clothes were tattered, they were dirty, and they had no shoes. But most of all, they had no hope. In fact, all they had between them was one cheap bottle of wine, which they passed back and forth as they sat. The wine was supposed to make them feel better, but they felt sadder and sadder as they drank. As one of the men put the bottle to his lips, he toasted sarcastically, To Christmas! May this be the happiest of holidays! Then he took a long swig. The other man grabbed the bottle, took a big gulp, and replied, Yeah, whatever. Then they sat, and sat, and sat, and sat. The Cunningham house was filled with the sounds of laughter and the smell of freshly baked cookies. The lights from the Christmas tree danced with the light from the television and created a rainbow-colored two-step that made the small living room as grand as a cathedral. The Christmas season brought the family together in a very special way. It was very important to Jeff and Angela Cunningham that their three children understood that Christmas was about more than presents. So, on this night, while Angela and Keisha happily baked cookies in the kitchen, Jeff and the boys, Rudy and Junior, watched the story of Sprinkles on television. Eight-year-old Rudy, who hadn't taken his eyes off the television since the movie began, climbed up onto his father's lap. He asked, Dad, it's a good thing Sprinkles came to Christmas Town, isn't it? Huh, Dad? Jeff put down the newspaper he had been reading and smiled at Rudy. Yes, son, it's a really good thing. Junior looked over from his perch on the couch and with a mischievous grin asked, Dad, don't you think it's time you told him the... Rudy interrupted. Told me what? Junior, Jeff yelled menacingly at his oldest son, while Rudy looked from his father to his brother with wide open eyes. Rudy opened his mouth to speak, but then Angela walked in with a tray of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies and stole his attention for the moment. How about some hot cookies for Mr. Cold Heart? Angela asked, addressing Junior. Come on, not you too, he replied with a pout. Jeff spoke to Junior. Okay, son, you explain this then. Why is it that every year at Christmas, you and a lot of other children make an amazing attitude adjustment, suddenly becoming the angels you were meant to be, and folks who never spoke a kind word to you started to wish you health and happiness? Junior hesitated. What? Well, um, it's just because they... Because Sprinkles is in their hearts, yelled Rudy triumphantly, jumping off his father's lap. Jeff smiled at his son's enthusiasm. That little reindeer was born with a heart as pure as gold. Even though she almost lost her way, her spirit was so strong she made it back against terrible odds. Just looking into her eyes makes people feel the true goodness inside themselves. Yeah, but she can't be pure all her life, said Junior with a snicker. She has to grow up sometime. That's what made her even more special, Jeff replied. She never grew up. She stayed young and innocent at heart. Her effect on people grew and multiplied with each passing year. Whenever folks came into contact with her, their hearts immediately filled with love and joy. And, as Sprinkles grew wiser, she managed to spread that feeling throughout Christmas Town and the whole world, especially at Christmas time. And that's why Santa called her the true spirit of Christmas. That's right, Rudy. That's just the way it happened. Rudy shot Junior a smug grin, a grin that said, See, big brother, I was right. Out loud, he said, I like that story, Dad. It's my favorite, and you always tell it the best. Tell it to me again, please. He smiled pleadingly at Jeff, who patted his always ready lap. Just then, Keisha, the oldest of the three children, walked in with a cookie in each hand. I like that story, too she mumbled with a mouthful of chocolate chips, especially the part when the kids get all that neat stuff. 
Against his own will, Junior found himself drawn into the conversation. My favorite part is when the dream stealers come and suck the dreams out of people's heads. He pondered about that for a moment. Hey, maybe that story's not so corny. I wonder if I could get them to suck the brains out of your head, Keisha. Now you two be nice, Jeff admonished. Or maybe they'll get both of you at the same time. Yeah, like a two-for-one, chimed in Rudy. Junior gave him a playful punch on the arm, and Keisha threw a pillow at him. Then they all started laughing and eating cookies, and pretty soon, it was bedtime. The next morning in Rudy's third-grade class, the teacher was late, and sprinkles was the number one topic of conversation. Hey, Pamela, Rudy called to his best friend. Did you watch The Spirit of Christmas last night? I'd never miss it, she replied excitedly. He's the cutest reindeer I've ever seen. She pointed to the wall behind the teacher's desk, where someone had thumbtacked an advertisement for the movie over a poster of Jackie Robinson. He's much cuter than old Rudolph, she said with a giggle. Rudy's response was drowned out by the approach of his arch enemies, Tyrone, Freddie, and Skippy. They were the class bullies and the class dummies, overly sensitive about having been left back twice. Everybody in the class was afraid of them, Rudy included. The trio approached with menacing frowns, Tyrone in front as usual. He was the leader, being the biggest, dumbest, and meanest. He had greasy black hair, bushy eyebrows, and a swagger he picked up in a John Wayne movie. Okay, enough baby talk. It's time to pay the man. Tyrone spoke like an apprentice gangster, always trying to imitate the older hoodlums he heard on the street. Skippy, who was Tyrone's pet puppet, seconded his leader's command. Yeah, milk money. Give it up. Time to get paid. Right, Ty? Freddy and Skippy approached the other kids, moving quickly before the teacher came in. Tyrone stayed with Rudy and Pamela. They overheard Freddy saying to one of the little girls, Come on, come on, you know what they say this time of year. It's better to give than to receive. Tyrone laughed, but it sounded more like a twisted grunt than a laugh. Rudy handed over his money. I don't know why you always go around bullying folks. It's part of my charm. Pamela, who was very brave and smarter than anyone else in the class, added sarcastically, I wonder if being left back twice has anything to do with why you keep taking our milk money every day. Pam, you got your facts all wrong, said Skippy, back from his rounds. Only Freddy and I have been left back twice. Ty got left back three times. Another robbed classmate chimed in. Wow, three times? You gotta try really hard to accomplish that. The kids all began to laugh, and Tyrone grabbed Rudy by the front of his shirt. His face was bright red, and he looked like a volcano might explode inside him at any moment. So you like to laugh? Today, you and that little reindeer pay double. Tyrone turned to Freddy and Skippy, and they nodded their approval. Rudy, still fresh from his wonder with Sprinkles, couldn't resist bringing him up again. You wouldn't treat folks like this if Sprinkles was any place near that dark heart of yours. Freddy and Skippy looked at each other in disbelief then started snickering. Baby talk? Baby talk, said Tyrone. Rudy Cunningham is in the third grade and still talks baby talk. There's no such thing as sprinkles or Santa Claus. It's all made up by Hallmark. There is two, cried Rudy, his passion stronger than his fear. So prove it. Tyrone's challenge made the other children draw back. Rudy and Pamela were on their own. But Rudy wasn't afraid, because he believed in sprinkles. Prove it? Okay, I can do that. Just wait till we get back from Christmas break. Yeah, that's it. I'll bring you proof. Yeah, and when he does, you gotta stop taking our milk money, added Pamela. Skippy looked panicked. How are we gonna eat if we don't take their money, Ty? Shut up, simple, barked Tyrone. He can't prove anything because they're all made-up things. Oh, right, agreed Skippy, relieved. Rudy whispered fiercely to Pamela, don't help, then turned his attention back to Tyrone, who was pointing to Rudy and laughing. 
Pay me now or pay me later. It's all the same. Then Tyrone addressed the rest of the class. And to all the rest of you little children, if Mr. Rudy Cunningham fails to bring me proof, then all of you will be paying double. The children fell silent and stared at Rudy, who stared at the door, wondering why the teacher was so late. But he felt the need to show he wasn't afraid. After all, he had been defending himself against Keisha and Junior for years. He put on a slow pumpkin grin and turned lazily to Tyrone. Double? Wouldn't you feel better if you went out and got a job? Tyrone growled. He knew the other kids were watching. I said double, and double is what I meant. Unless you care to admit right now that Sprinkles doesn't exist, then things will go back to normal. This is your only out. You better take it before I change my mind. Rudy stood up as straight as he could and said with a fake English accent, Could you please turn your head in another direction? I can't hold my breath much longer. Rudy laughed along with the other kids, but he was afraid he had gone too far. Still, Tyrone wouldn't hit him in front of the whole class. Would he? He looked like he might. Maybe I should just pound you out right now, he yelled, shaking his fist in Rudy's face. Now Rudy felt really scared, but he tried to hide it with a joke. Wait, wouldn't it be better if you pound me later and got double too? Tyrone, apparently realizing that he couldn't very well hit Rudy in front of all those witnesses, relented. I can pound you any time, he threatened, but I'll be waiting for your proof. Tyrone turned and walked away, with Freddy and Skippy close behind. Better come up with the goods, Cunningham, jibed Freddy. Yeah, the goods, yeah, added Skippy. Shut up, Skippy, yelled Tyrone and Freddy. Then the three of them walked out of the classroom. Pamela turned to Rudy and put her arm around his shoulder. I know you can do it, Rudy, she volunteered. Thanks, Pam, but don't get crazy with your Christmas fun this year. Chapter 3 That afternoon, as Rudy was leaving school, one of his classmates punched him in the arm and warned, My financial future is in your hands, Cunningham. Thanks, Rudy replied sarcastically. Just what I need, more pressure. Rudy sat down on the swings and looked around the schoolyard nervously. What if Tyrone couldn't wait till after Christmas break? He seemed like the type of kid who needed to see blood pretty frequently. Rudy wondered what Tyrone's family was like, imagining a greasy-haired, brooding clan with horns and tails. He pictured them punching each other, with squishy red pulp flying through the air. Then he pictured his own family, eating cookies in front of the television, and he groaned. It wouldn't even be a fair fight, he said out loud. What wouldn't be a fair fight? asked Junior, who had come with Keisha to pick Rudy up from school. Oh, nothing. Just something I said got me in trouble today. What did you hit them with today? asked Keisha. Was it urban reform or the declining education budget? Yeah said Junior, a note of annoyance worming into his voice. How come you know so much stuff? I've been around a lot longer than you, and I don't know half the stuff you talk about. I second that, chirped Keisha, pushing Rudy on the swing. You too? asked Junior with surprise. No, stupid. I meant that I know you don't have the foggiest idea of what your little brother is talking about. Like you do? I didn't say I did, but I'm not saying I don't, either. Junior stuck out his tongue and crossed his eyes. Keisha blew him a kiss. Hey, Rudy complained. At what point does the concern come back to the kid with the problem? Tyrone wants double the money from everyone now, and it's all my fault. I don't get it, sighed Junior. In my day, the school bully never asked for a raise. Times sure have changed. Rudy gave him a dirty look and turned his attention to Keisha. Well. We won't have to pay him anything ever again if I can prove to him that Sprinkles is real. With a wink at Junior, Keisha ignored Rudy's last comment. So, do you have to pay these guys weekly, or is there some deferred plan you can take? 
she asked, barely stifling a laugh. Rudy jumped off the swing in disgust. Why do I ever talk to you two? I needed some intelligent advice, and what do I get? Dumb and her kid brother real stupid. Come on, Rudy, come back, called Keisha, but Rudy ran as fast as he could out of the schoolyard. Then he came back in through an entrance on the other side, so Junior and Keisha wouldn't find him if they came looking. He lay down in the cold grass and stared up at the gray clouds that swirled furiously around the pale yellow sun. He closed his eyes and focused his brain on the problems at hand. Is Sprinkles real? And if so, how do I prove it? Am I nuts? Am I going to get killed after Christmas break? Was I adopted or are my brother and sister just morons? All those questions made him tired and he fell asleep. He dreamt about Tyrone and how Santa Claus wouldn't bring him any more toys. When he woke, he was shivering, and a pale pink light in the sky was the only thing saving him from total darkness and tears. He jumped up quickly and ran home, wondering if Keisha and Junior had told their parents what had happened. He opened the front door cautiously, ready with an excuse if one was needed. But nobody jumped out at him. Nobody demanded an explanation. Pretty sweet he thought to himself. Maybe my siblings have one or two redeeming qualities after all. As he tiptoed past the living room, he heard his name and walked inside. Good evening, son. Keisha told me you were out playing with your friend Jake this afternoon. She told you that? I mean, yeah, we just hung out at his house. Where's mom? She went shopping. She'll be back soon. Go do your homework. Chapter 4 After a delicious dinner of fried chicken, sweet potatoes, and homemade buttermilk biscuits, Rudy climbed onto his father's lap and pushed aside the newspaper he was reading. So, what are you doing? I believe I was reading, Jeff replied warily. Rudy continued, What were you reading? Anything you want to talk about? Jeff got it. No, Rudy. Is there anything you want to talk about? Well, since you asked, you're up on everything, right? Jeff laughed. Sometimes it was very nice being a father. Most of the time I am. Why? Rudy got very serious. He stared into his father's eyes. We can talk man to man, can't we, Dad? Sure, son. No problem. Still staring hard into his father's eyes, Rudy asked, You would tell me if something wasn't true wouldn't you? Yes. So the story about Sprinkles and Christmas Town is true, isn't it? Huh, Dad? Huh? Well, do you think it's true? Jeff asked. Of course I do. Jeff dropped his newspaper to the floor and pulled Rudy close. Remember what I told you? If there's something you believe in, nobody has the right to try to make you feel differently. I wish Tyrone knew that responded Rudy glumly. Who's Tyrone? He's kind of like the class financial consultant. You mean the class bully, confirmed Jeff, nodding his head. We had those when I was your age, too. So what happened? Nothing, really. I was talking with Pamela about Sprinkles, and Tyrone and his friends overheard. They started to tease me, saying there was no such thing as Santa or Sprinkles, and that the whole story was made up to trick little kids into feeling good about themselves. I told him he didn't know what he was talking about. So what did he say? Jeff was very interested, having had his own run-ins with a class bully some thirty years earlier. He was proud of Rudy for sticking up for himself, but he was worried, too. Just then, Junior walked by, his hands filled with cookies. Said he needed more cash to support his early childhood career in crime, he shouted on his way to the den. Rudy and his father exchanged rolled eyes and resumed their conversation. I didn't want to look bad in front of the other kids, Rudy continued, so I told him that I would prove it. That's when he said if I didn't, he wanted double his money, and not just from me, from the whole class. You'll pay him nothing, Jeff shouted. You want to tell Tyrone that? Come on, Dad, just help me get the proof. 
okay? Saved by a loud crash, Jeff didn't have to respond. He and Rudy jumped up to investigate. They found Junior in the den, standing amid broken glass and broken cookies. I didn't do it, he protested before anyone said a word. I got here just before you did. Junior, that vase was brand new. I just bought it for your mother's birthday. Yeah, it was nice, said Junior. Jeff threw up his hands in exasperation. Just pick up this mess and then off to bed. Maybe a few things will be spared if you're asleep. He walked out of the room, and Rudy followed. Hey, Rudy, where are you going? Give me a hand, will you? begged Junior. Rudy didn't turn around. He needed to talk to his mom. He followed the cookie smell to the kitchen. More cookies. Fresh cookies. Christmas was the best. Red and white Santa cookies were cooling on a tray when Rudy walked in. Hey, Mom, you make the best cookies in town, he complimented, grabbing a handful that had already cooled. You should write a cookbook or something. Thank you, Angela replied, wiping the sweat from her upper lip with the dish towel she had wrapped around her waist. But I didn't get a master's degree in psychology to become Aunt Jemima. I think I've baked enough cookies to last the rest of the year. I know, agreed Rudy, kissing her cheek. Now run off, you. I'm exhausted and I have to clean up before I can drag myself off to bed. Rudy hesitated, then kissed her again. Good night, Mom. Good night. Kiss, kiss. Love you. Rudy walked to his bedroom, determined to get a good night's sleep. He was not going to worry about stupid Tyrone all night. When he got there, Junior was already in bed and Jeff was checking his homework. After he checked Rudy's homework, he kissed both of them goodnight and turned off the lights. Good night, boys. The angel of the night will watch over you while you sleep. Then he went to say good night to Keisha. Later that night, Keisha was awakened by a loud crash and woke to find Junior standing next to her bed. She screamed, Junior! I didn't do it, I swear. I didn't do it. Junior's familiar refrain filled the already broken silence. Junior Cunningham, if I find that you accidentally broke something in mine, I'm going to accidentally break your neck. Junior was about to repeat his innocence when they heard their dad's voice thundering from downstairs. I want everyone asleep now. Do I make myself clear? Junior scrambled back to his room, but he was unable to sleep. Rudy was also unable to sleep because Junior kept up a steady stream of chatter. Finally, in desperation, Rudy called out to Jeff for a glass of water. Me too, yelled Junior. A few minutes later, their weary father trudged into their bedroom with two glasses of water and a stern face. Now, you drink this and then not another peep out of either of you. No problem, Dad, they replied in unison. But then Junior reached for Rudy's glass, and in the process, knocked over both glass and nightstand. Jeff came running back in, steaming. I didn't do it, moaned Junior, crossing his heart. You gotta believe me this time. I didn't do it, I swear. So who did it? Did a little man appear out of nowhere? Junior jumped at his dad's suggestion. Wow, dial the psychic hotline. That's just what happened. See, this little man, you know the one, Dad. He came in through the window. I guess he got a little thirsty, and Rudy's glass was just sitting there nice and cold and filled almost to the top. That's enough, son. Dad, you gotta hear me out, Junior pleaded. I'm telling you the truth this time. He went for Rudy's water, and I tried to stop him. And that's when he broke the nightstand and jumped back out the window. I would have caught him, but... He got a good head start, and he was really fast. But if we'd been even Stephen, I would have caught him, and none of this would have happened, and you wouldn't be looking at me like that. Jeff shook his head in disbelief, but was too tired to argue. Okay, if that's what happened, it's over now. Go to sleep, and if anyone else comes into your room, just let him have whatever he wants, and maybe you won't break anything. He looked around the room as if checking for a strange little man then said good night and left. Chapter 5 
Some time later, a strange light began to fly around the room, flickering close to Rudy. Junior was fast asleep, but Rudy had lain awake thinking about Tyrone. Rudy, I need your help. Rudy answered what he thought was Junior's voice. I'm trying to sleep. I'll help you tomorrow, okay? The light danced bright circles around Rudy's face to capture his attention. Now, Rudy, she ordered in her high, thin voice. Rudy sat up wide awake. Wait a minute. Get that light out of my eyes. He still thought it was Junior. Shh, whispered the light. You'll wake everyone. Now Rudy realized what was happening. God, I must be losing it. A talking light? I really need your help, Rudy. Please come with me, the light implored, ignoring his confusion. Wait a minute. What's wrong with this picture? Lights don't talk. Who are you? What are you? Just as the light had feared, Rudy woke Junior, who called out sleepily for Rudy to be quiet. Rudy looked at him, already asleep again after speaking, then back at the light that was hovering near him. I've got to be dreaming, he said softly. This is too weird to be real. Maybe if I close my eyes, I'll dream about something else. Rudy, this isn't a dream. I'm real. Come on, we're wasting time. The light got brighter. Rudy finally came to. I can't go with you, he told the light. I don't know who or what you are. And besides, I have to ask my dad's permission before I leave the house. I'm China, the princess of dreams, the light explained. I've been watching you for a long time, and you're the only one who can help me. Rudy stopped now to take a good look at China. She had wings like an angel, but otherwise looked like a fairy tale version of Wonder Woman. She wore a bright blue outfit, white boots, and a gold tiara. She looked strong, like someone who was used to getting her way, yet nice, someone who used her powers only for good. But why me? I'm just a kid. What can I do? he asked, secretly flattered. What I need is somebody with a pure heart. Yours is so clean it sparkles. Trust me, Rudy, you stand out from all the others. And for what I need you to do, we're going to need everything you have in that heart of yours to keep you safe from the dream stealers. Rudy became excited when he heard about the dream stealers. He remembered them from the Christmas story, how they stole people's dreams in order to make them lose the Christmas spirit. As if reading Rudy's mind, China added, Just like in the story, now hurry, we don't have much time left if we're going to find Sprinkles and bring her back to Christmas Town in time for Christmas. And if we don't find her, the spirit of Christmas will be lost, and the world will be a dark and lonely place forever. It was a big responsibility for a little boy. You picked me to help? Rudy asked, still somewhat in shock. Are you coming now or what? asked China, losing her patience. Rudy threw up his hands. What choice do I have? You talk and fly and who knows what else. So I guess I'm in. Rudy leapt out of bed, threw on his jeans, sneakers, and a Cleveland Indians baseball jacket, and looked at China for a command. She led him to his closet. Rudy stopped short, suddenly rethinking his heroism. Wait, that's my closet, he protested. I'm not going in there without the light of day. I've lost three pairs of my best Nikes to the beast who lives there at night. As China tried to push Rudy into the closet, the noise woke Junior again. Hey, Rudy, where are you going? Got something to do. Go back to sleep. Can't it wait till morning? Keep it down, said Rudy, putting his fingers to his lips. I'll be back soon. Now Junior was really awake. He finally noticed China and started yelling. Where do you think you're going, and what is that? Junior's yelling woke Keisha, who ran into the room, also yelling. Hey, what's with all the noise? Some of us normal people are trying to get some sleep. Then she saw Rudy. And Mr. Rudy Cunningham, where do you think you're going all dressed up? Christmas Town. 
You've got to be nuts. I wonder if Mom and Dad know you're running off to Christmas Town with that flying light around your head, yelling. She stopped, momentarily dumbfounded, and just stared at China. She rubbed her eyes, closed them, and opened them again. A talking light? Oh my God! She yelled frantically. I'm going to get Dad. He'll help you. Stay right here. I'll... Keisha, wait! Rudy grabbed Keisha's arm and tried to stop her from leaving the room. I'm okay. China needs me. Just please keep it down. I swear, I'm okay. China saw her opportunity and began to pull Rudy into the closet. Rudy grabbed onto the door, but then gave up and let China have him. I hope the boogeyman doesn't have a taste for fairies, he told her, because if he shows up, you're on your own. As China pulled Rudy deeper into the closet, she lit up with radiant colors of red, blue, pink, and yellow. Ahead of them, a wall opened up, and the colors were out there, too. It was a rainbow world, and Rudy could just barely glimpse it through the opening. China looked at Rudy calmly for the first time. Just hold on to me and jump. Rudy was excited by the colors, but still a little nervous. This Christmas town doesn't come with its own boogeyman, does it? He asked with a snort. Just jump, China ordered. As Rudy and China jumped, Keisha and Junior finally sprang into action. Keisha reached in and grabbed Rudy's arm, preventing his descent into Christmas Town. Don't worry, little brother, I have you now. Junior, how about a little help? Rudy struggled to break free from Keisha, but Junior was now helping her. Junior grabbed onto the doorknob for more leverage. It was the doorknob and Junior and Keisha against China in a life-or-death tug-of-war for Rudy. But Rudy wanted to go with China and was trying to help her as much as he could by twisting and squirming away from Keisha. Just then, a baseball bat fell down off the wall and hit Junior's hand, causing him to let go of the nearly broken doorknob. All four of them tumbled through the opening into the brightness that was Christmas Town. <laughs>